All right. Uh, hi, folks. Welcome to the behind the scenes session focusing on exploring the AWS global network. Um, original title was something about global networking, higher performance, and cat photo distributions. Um, we thought that maybe heard some feedback that that sounded a little too CDN like, so um, decided to change it a bit. Um, and there will be some cat photos, although um, a lot of it's going to focus on the AWS network, and we'll dive into a little bit more detail. Um, my name is Tom Scholl. I'm a senior principal network engineer in the AWS networking group, mainly focus on a lot of our backbone connectivity, uh, as well as our network infrastructure as it relates to to and from the internet. Um, I'm up here with Steve Seymour, who's a principal solutions architect. He works across Europe, Middle East, and a Africa, with, some of our with our customers focusing on their network architecture and requirements when deploying into AWS. He'll come up here a little bit later in the presentation and talk about another part. So one of the, in this session, what we're going to talk about is a few different parts here. One of them is going to be some of the key themes that you'll find throughout the presentation in the AWS network. Um, and that includes uh, a variety of different items. And as we go from there, we'll talk into about how the network actually looks like from our perspective. Um, and I've given this conversation, this talk with other customers, um, as well as people inside of Amazon to describe what the AWS network looks like. And one of the ideas is really kind of starting from the bottom up. Start from the data centers and work your way up through the AWS regions um, to the backbone and to our internet edge um, at our edge pops. So let's start with kind of an overview of the AWS global network. As I mentioned, there's going to be some key themes that we're going to go over. Security and availability are a really important part of it. And from a security perspective, you'll see how we do things like implementing some security controls at the perimeter of our network. Um, availability, also really important. Um, and you'll see that in how we do things with like strong isolation from failures, um, how we've taken concepts that you've seen in, maybe in the software and service space of cellular architectures and how that translates over into the networking infrastructure side. Finally, we'll talk about scale, which is something that we constantly have to do in the network, which is continually scaling it up to support customer traffic. And a the final theme is on performance. And what that means is really when you look at things like low latency between regions, with the, between availability zones, um, as well as uh, things like throughput and looking at like, things within a region, like you can do with jumbo packets and things like that. So let's start by start with something a little bit simpler here, which is an example of a customer traffic flow. In this case, we have a cat that wants to go to an EC2 instance where there's other cat photos on there. Um, and in that case, at a high level, basically looks like something on the internet that needs to talk to a region. Within that region, you have an EC2 instance that runs within inside of a VPC that lives inside of an availability zone, which lives inside of a region. Now, there's been other talks um, given at reInvent in the past that talk about the network. For example, things like VPC and some of the technologies that go into it and how it operates. Um, there's also been other things that talk about some of the things we've done with like server and network cards, but we've never really talked about in great detail about what goes actually inside the network infrastructure. This is our first attempt at really going to a level uh, a little bit deeper. So um, let's take a look at what that actually looks like to someone like me. Um, within the AWS network, we have a lot of different things that are stitched together. Um, we have data centers, which live inside of availability zones, which are part of regions. They have transit centers that are basically serve as our on-ramp and off-ramp onto our global backbone. And then we have internet connectivity, which goes into the transit centers within a region, as well as to edge pops at the perimeter of the network. And from our perspective, you don't really have to know all these different things. We certainly have to, but you don't have to know all these things in order to build on top of AWS. So let's start from the bottom up, basically from the AWS regions, and go on from there. So one of the concepts we have is availability zones. Now, availability zones, um, they provide that failure isolation between, from, other ADS, uh, from other availability zones within a region. Um, they also have direct connectivity between the availability zones. Um, the availability zones themselves can include one or multiple, typically it's many, data centers as part of them. Um, the interconnectivity between avail within data centers within an availability zone um, are, are built for low latency and they're in close proximity. Um, one of the main things also is that the scalability part, which is that we have to continue to scale the network as things grow. For example, an availability zone can't really be capped. We have to be able to scale it out further and further. And then looking at an AWS region from this perspective, you have uh, multiple parts here. You have data centers within availability zones and the transit centers. And there's different kind of types of connectivity that we have here. Between data centers, um, we have a lot of connectivity that actually put them together within that availability zone. And then we have inter-availability zone links, and then we have the transit centers that provide the connectivity outside of them. 
Um, one thing that's really interesting is that like, if you have an elastic IP and that lives within an availability zone, when the traffic goes into a region, we send that traffic directly to that availability zone. We don't spray it to the other ones. It goes directly to where it needs to go, where it lives. And if you move that elastic IP to another availability zone, that traffic will move accordingly. And also, if you have any traffic that leaves an availability zone, it goes directly to the transit centers to egress for inner region traffic or to in the internet. Say again? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, actually, we're going to have a meet and greet that's going to be after this session. Um, and then you can, we'll be there. We can talk about it. So. All right. Uh, so within the availability zones, we have a number of data centers. And there's really kind of two types of traffic that we have to uh, support. For example, we have side-to-side -side traffic, or basically host-to-host -host communication. And then we have up and down, or north-to-south traffic, which basically goes, is traffic that's to and from the internet, as well as other inter-region traffic. Um, another part that's really important about uh, availability zones is that they have to be elastic. And that the way we treat these uh, availability zones, we have to think on different dimensions of how we scale them. For example, intra-availability zone capacity, inter-availability zone capacity, as well as how do you scale up the internet and inter AWS region capacity through the transit centers. So when it goes to building a scalable data center, what are some of the things that you need? And some of this includes basically you have to build the network in network building blocks. You have to basically make these components that you can bolt onto the network and continually add them and do it again and again and again. Um, you have to basically make it easy to, in order to do that and attach them onto the network um, in right-sized increments. Um, one other part that's really critical is that the strong, you need to have strong isolation boundaries um, when you go and build these components, these building blocks that we put together. Um, and along with that, it brings additional capacity that they have to deliver as well. Now, uh, another really important part of the data center is the actual networking technology that you use, and that includes things like routers, the connectivity and links between them, and the control plane. And the control plane is a really critical part, um, mainly because it's the protocols and it's the controllers that actually drive the network. And without a control plane, or if it's not working properly, there really isn't any network. And so from our perspective, the control plane um, can't scale out of control as you scale the network. As you start attaching these additional building blocks into the network, the control plane cannot be put at risk. So we do a lot of things in, in order to compartmentalize the control plane as we scale out the networks within a data center. So here's an example, kind of a high-level drawing of what sort of the cellular data center uh, network architecture looks like. Um, inside of it, we've got these individual cells that serve a particular function. Um, some of these include things like the access cells that are associated with taking in um, po uh, ports from hosts, for example. Um, and then you have cells that are responsible for intra-availability zone connectivity. You have connectivity that's responsible for inter-availability zone connectivity. And finally, like edge cells, which basically make up traffic going to, basically leaving the region, going to the internet or other AWS regions. Um, within each one of these cells are a number of routers. We'd like to go really wide when we deploy these routers, and we have rows of the, uh, these devices that are in, in a particular layer. Um, we'd like to go really wide because it brings us certain really nice availability properties in which we know that routers are going to fail and links are going to fail. And the idea is that we've over-engineered the layers within each one of these cells so that they're redundant within them, themselves. They're also compartmentalized to a degree, so they, we have real, a lot of controls when it comes to how much control plane state can actually be shared between them. And we have very specific touch points on how that's uh, accomplished. And then within all these cells, um, we have uh, a, basically a fabric of lots of many, many, many devices, many routers in there that uh, provide interconnectivity between the two, between individual cells themselves. Now, one thing that's interesting is that as we build this network, we don't really like the idea, the concept of like an active or a standby router in the network. What I mean by that is that you don't want to have to wait for when you want to use something, when something fails and it goes on to another path. Really don't like that idea because if it's something that you're not exercising frequency, frequently, how do you know it's actually going to work? So a lot of the forwarding architecture within the network is built on the, the basis that everything's active and it's forwarding traffic. So we don't see any of those surprises because we don't like those sorts of surprises when you expect something to work and it doesn't. So, one of the things I brought up was the networking technology that we use in the network, and routers are a really big part of that. Um, there's kind of two different flavors or schools of thought when it comes to actually using different routers inside of these kind of environments. 
Um, one of them is a large chassis routers, right? And that, you're looking at something that could be half a rack or a full rack system. And in that case, you've got a router that's fairly large, um, brings a lot of ports to the table, but it also brings a larger failure domain. If you lose that device, that's a whole lot of capacity and ports going with it too, which isn't always that optimal. Um, they do bring some things such as there's some flexibility. For example, larger chassis-based systems, generally are line cards, you have different modules. You can, on those line cards, you can have different port mixtures, different speeds, so it gives some level of flexibility if you need that. It also brings that there's fewer devices that you have to manage. For some people, that's really important. Um, finally, on the larger chassis boxes, you also have a different kind of forwarding architecture, in which case it's in multiple stages of forwarding um, that have to go on within the platform. Now, if we flip that a bit to look at things like single chip routers, it's a little different. You're looking at like a one RU or two rack unit type platform, a little bit smaller, has a fixed amount of ports, fewer ports, but they have a nice kind of fail contained failure domain. Also gives you uh, the property that you're going to have to deal with is that you're going to have a lot more routers to manage in order to provide the equivalent level of capacity, which brings its own uh, things you have to accommodate as a result of that. It does have a simpler forwarding architecture, uh, which is nice to have when you compare it to some of the larger chassis platforms. So let's take a look at that. So if you look at a larger chassis-based platform, let's start from the top down and kind of walk through what's going on inside this type of box. Um, in here, you've got the line cards. And the line cards themselves are going to have a few different things on them. They'll have the front end facing ports, and they're going to have one or multiple switching and forwarding ASICs on them. Basically, the whole chassis, the enclosure, is basically lots of individual kind of routers working together. Each one of those line cards almost is a router unto itself. Now, you have these line cards, and you're going to need to have traffic that needs to actually talk between line cards. Well, you, for that, you need some sort of a switching fabric uh, that provides interconnectivity between the line cards. And in order to do that, you probably want to have multiple of these switching fabrics so that they're redundant. Um, so it could be in some configuration of M plus one or some kind of variation of that um, to actually support facilitating transporting traffic between the line cards themselves. And what's kind of interesting here is that on some of these platforms, if you look at, you know, if you wanted to tap what's going on between the line card and the switching fabric, that's not just regular IP traffic. That's typically some sort of packet that's being encoded and transmitting across there. So if you were trying to dig in and troubleshoot it, you can't just take on Wireshark and take a look. A lot of these cases, it's some kind of special encoding um, and the, it's own kind of under the hood routing that's going on there. So it's a little bit more complex. Now, you have these switching fabrics. We probably have several of them um, that connect all these line cards together. The next part down that's really important is the route processor or supervisor. It's basically the brain of the router. This is where the routing protocols operate. This is how you configure the device. Um, this is what handles programming all the forwarding tables of all those line cards within the chassis, which can be quite a task. And then you actually have another thing that's really important, which is telemetry. You have all these ports in this given box, that's a lot of statistics that you need to carry um, in terms of port counters, uh, packets per second, bits per second, um, all that telemetry that's coming off those line cards generally will go and bottleneck on that single route processor and CPU that's on, on, the, on the device itself. Um, NetFlow data, SFlow data, things like that. Now you've got this brain that runs the device that handles all these important functions. Well, are you really content with just having one? So a lot of different platforms will offer you to have an additional route processor or supervisor. In that case, um, well, now you're kind of back to that same point of having an active and a standby, which you know, brings its own complications. So if you were to have one of the route processors fail, it flips over to another one. Um, in that process, that might not be hitless. All the routing protocols might bounce um, as a result of that. Or there's some cases where there's additional complexity in that some state gets replicated to the second route processor. And in that case, um, there's a bit more complexity or potential software issues that come with that. So you've got the brain, you've got the raw processor, you probably need to have more than one of those, and then you finally get to the bottom, which is the power supply and the fans. Um, on some of these bigger chassis platforms that are really tall, um, sometimes you have things like power zones, and because not all the power supplies can energize the entire platform, and it gets really complicated when you're trying to figure out, well, what power zone energizes one part of the box versus the other part of the box? Um, what happens if you lose this? Can, all the, can the thing run on the other remaining power supply? So it gets really complicated, and it's almost like looking at a modern commercial aircraft where you have something where you have a green hydraulic system and a yellow one and a blue one, and certain ones serve for certain areas of it. I think that's pretty complicated if you have to worry about that in, in some of your routers. So it's a bit more complicated of a platform. And if something was to break in there, one component in here, can you actually effectively troubleshoot it rapidly? The other option is if you think the device is sick, you can shift it away. You're also losing a lot of capacity that comes with it as well.
All right, so flip this around to another platform, which is a single chip based uh, type device, which is a 1RU, 2RU kind of platform, something that we really like in our data centers. In this case, you've got the front end facing ports, you've got a single routing switching ASIC, you've got a single uh, route processor or supervisor, and then you have dual power supplies. In this case, it's really simple. Bits go in, bits go out. Single lookup, it leaves the device. You compare that to large chassis box, you have to go through the ingress line card, to the switching fabric, to the egress line card, and out again. On this platform, a lot simpler. Anything coming in and out of this device is going to be IP. It's really easy to troubleshoot that. Um, you have a single route processor, makes it real easy. If the thing fails, that's fine. Device goes out of service. You lose the control plane. Everything else goes away with it. So it's something that we uh, like a lot. Another part is that on these platforms, we actually operate, we actually build our own operating system that goes on these boxes as well. So we have end-to-end -end ownership of the code that's deployed on them, the routing protocols, the entire stack, which gives us a lot of visibility into what's really happening under the hood in a very simple architecture and kind of sticks with the, the KISS principle here. Um, and we like it quite a lot. Now, if you're going to have all these small chip routers in a network, you have to be able to operate the network properly. Um, and there's a few things that, get, that are really important there. One of them is the automation component um, and basically building programmatic configuration. When you have so many different devices, the router itself can't be the authority. You have to build a system that actually understands the network topology, that understands what, what things are connected to other devices, and you have to understand uh, what functions may live on that device. And it shouldn't live on the router. It should actually live in a system that's responsible. Because at one point, that router is going to fail, and you're going to want to swap it out. And when you're going to want to bring it back into service, and you don't want to be in the position where you have to cut and paste whatever was the previous config on there and get it on the new device, you're going to want to have a system basically bring that device online, give it its correct configuration, and go through a return to service workflow where you're doing the right pre and post checks where you can safely bring the device back in line and doing it what it was doing before. You really can't have situations where you have uh, routers with specific functions that have some kind of unique quality. Um, like to use the term, what you don't want to have is artisanal, farm to table, handcrafted routers. You, know, you want to make it very uniform and very simple to understand. So you have a lot of these devices. You also have to deal with the fact that there's realities of you run a big network, you have a lot of links between them. How do you actually know that the network's running healthy? And so we use a variety of techniques to actually go and validate what, what's going on inside the network and if there's any problems. One of them is active data plane probing. Um, and in that case, we're actually building probing traffic that is going across the entire network on every router and every link. So we get that visibility and end-to-end -end connectivity. What is the latency of that communication? Is there packet loss? One really cool thing that it also brings us is the ability to triangulate a fault in the network, and we can actually identify where that problem is and then go uh, and generate alert. Now, another part is statistical deviations and anomaly detection. And what that means is, kind of break this down into a simpler term, or a simpler way to explain it, would be what traffic goes into a router should come out. It's real simple. How many bits go in? You should see how much comes out. There's always some little discrepancy because there's some traffic that actually is bound for that device. But you can actually look across every router in the network and see if there's something that isn't ma matching up right. And you can generate alert to say that there's something abnormal going on here. Um, as I mentioned in our cells, we have lots of routers that are scattered horizontally. Um, you can also identify situations where you know, we think all these devices are roughly equivalent. If there's one router that's not pushing as much traffic as the other ones, we can use that to also generate alert um, to say that there's something that doesn't look right here. The routers themselves also generate a fair amount of telemetry that's really useful for us. For example, we grab a lot of the syslog information that comes out of the routers and we classify those messages and generate that into our uh, uh, alerting system. Um, there's other things, too, that you can look at as well. For example, um, the ASICs that we have in there generate their own messages. The ASICs themselves, we can actually interrogate specific registers and understand, is this doing the right thing that we expect it to? Does anything look strange here? Finally, we can look at things that are finite resources on routers, table sizes, things like that, from a route affording table size or for, um, uh, link adjacencies. We can look at that information to know, is this thing growing out of control or something doesn't look right here? And we can generate an alert. Finally, the other part is deep component monitoring. What I mean by that is looking at the hardware itself, um, looking at things like the power supplies, the voltage on the platform, looking at environmentals and temperature to know if everything is looking correct there. Um, another part of that 
it also involves some of the components that we put into the router. For example, pluggable technologies. Um, are those pluggable optics, for example? Are they operating at the right voltage and the right temperatures? Um, another thing that's really neat is that you can actually go and look at the light level that you're receiving on a link and understanding, is this within the, th the threshold in which it should be operating? Or is the signal degrading over time? And we think that this is actually a component that's going to fail at some point in the future, and then we can go and take action. And action's a really important part because with all this network monitoring, it doesn't really do any good if you know, you're collecting all these alerts. You have to actually mitigate the problem. And in that case, we have all of our alerting that goes and feeds into an auto mitigation system that can go and take action. And those are machines that do that. That's not alerts going to people. That's completely computer driven. And like, to give you an example of that would be something like um, an alert would come up and it could drive an action where if a link is having errors, go and shift that link out of service. Or if something doesn't look right with a router, go and take that device out of service. And we've built these cells horizontal, and we've over-engineered them so that we can take routers out of service any point in the network and not compromise on availability or capacity demands of customer traffic. Another part within the AWS regions are the intra-availability zone and inter-availability zone connectivity. Um, so this is basically the bulk fiber that we use to actually connect everything all together. We've established these spans of connectivity within an availability zone and between the availability zones to provide a lot of capacity for the network. Um, we optimize for low latency, and a real critical part of this is physical diversity. So when we go and we connect these things together, we want to make sure that they're on redundant paths. And we use basically geospatial coordinates to actually identify the specific fiber path, and we know where it actually goes in on the ground. So we can actually verify that the paths that leave a particular data center are going through diverse entry points, and that they're taking a path where they don't converge together. Um, that's all of our controlled infrastructure that we have in place. And there's a lot of different mechanisms that we can use to even validate that that's working as we expect. For example, we can take optical light loss levels and understand what, how long should that path be that matches up with our coordinates and actually validate that that is on the right path that we expect. And if there's a fiber cut, we can look afterwards and understand, did anything, any properties change with that fiber that needs to be looked into? And that's constantly going on all the time, and it's always being collected. Um, on the slide here, we have a few different pictures that I, I took. Um, in previous reInvents, there's been some talks from James Hamilton talking about some of our cables. We've talked about one fiber bulk cable that we had. It has 3,456 individual fiber strands on it. Um, we've actually gone bigger than that. We've actually doubled it. We have a 6,912 cable. Um, and they, if you look at the cable, there's quite a lot of fiber in there. And then they have a metal core, which gives it strength, but also allows us to trace the cable from the surface. It gives us some nice capabilities there. The bottom right, uh, the blue cable there, is something, a cable that we have to use in one part of the world. And that's specifically in Australia, because there's a particular termite that'll eat through fiber and has a special coating on it that actually prevents it from happening. Um, we're going to, at the meet and greet, I've got some fiber samples um, in my bag. If you want to come by, you can actually see some of these. We've got some samples that you can take a look at of different uh, fiber uh, densities, if you'd like to take a look. Finally, another part is uh, how do we get more capacity out of that? And I mentioned you know, we've got these fiber cables that we set up that have a lot of fibers on them, and you can light that up for you know, 10 gig or 100 gig. Um, but one of the interesting things is, well, the fiber's in the ground, can we get more out of it? And that's where we use technology like dense wavelength division multiplexing, or DWDM, where we can actually take that fiber pair, where you have transmit and receive, and we can actually go and say, well, normally it could just be a 100 gig interface, or we can actually put N by 100 gig interfaces on it by transmitting a laser um, at tuned at different frequencies, and then you can get multiple 100 gig interfaces on that fiber pair. So with the fiber in the ground, you can actually extend it and bring even more capacity onto it over time and not have to drop down another fiber, for example. One other part of the ADOS regions that I talked about, uh, touched on a bit earlier, is the transit centers. And there are on-ramp and off-ramp onto the backbone and to and from the local internet connectivity. They're optimized to build a local internet con interconnection um, within that particular geographic area. Um, the availability zones are connected redundantly to all the transit centers that are local there. Um, and we generally put the facilities in locations where uh, we can easily connect to and run fiber between different uh, external networks and establish pairing relationships. So now that we've kind of moved on from the AWS region, let's talk a bit about the global backbone. So the AWS global network backbone, um, a number of AWS services ride on top of it today. Uh, example of that, of that is AWS Direct Connect, 
that goes traffic from Direct Connect Pops will ride over the backbone, bring your traffic into a region. Internet connectivity, we can also ride on top of the backbone and pick and choose what kind of locations on the internet we want to bring traffic to and from. Region to region communication also goes on top of the backbone. Finally, services like Amazon CloudFront uh, for CloudFront Pops that are connected onto the backbone, all their connections for origin fetch, if it comes from an AWS resource, for example, if it's pulling an origin fetch from S3, that'll run over the backbone. Or if you're using something like uh, S3 Transfer Accelerator, that'll go through a CloudFront Pop that will talk to our network. There we go. Uh, so this is a picture of the AWS Global Backbone. This is actually from 2017, uh, Peter DeSantis' um, uh, Tuesday Night Live, I think, presentation. Um, he's going to be doing a Monday Night Live presentation tonight with an updated version of the Backbone. Um, so if you do want to see it, you can take a look and see how the topology has changed a bit between now and then. Um, just give me an idea. This is all around the globe connectivity, 100 gig uh, for all of our Backbone circuits. Um, it's pretty cool, something we're definitely proud of. Um, but highly recommend taking a look at Peter's presentation later this evening. So I'll kind of ask a simple question here. Why have a backbone network? Um, one of them is security. And the idea is that we're going to have region-to-region -region traffic. Uh, we want to have that riding on our own infrastructure rather than the internet. We don't want to have to worry about traffic going onto the internet to get to another region um, and some of the potentials there for you know, whether it be traffic being diverted or black hole or anything like that. We want to make sure that that's not a factor. So that's why it definitely brings us the security angle of keeping the traffic on, on our own infrastructure. Availability is another really important part. What I mean by that is, if I go to a transit provider and I, you know, I want to just drop down 200, 300 gigs of traffic to get to some other potential endpoint, there's a good chance it might not get there. A lot of the core transit providers that make up the internet, they scale based upon what they observe over a period of time. So that you can't just drop in a, a workload of a sudden rush of traffic without congesting something in their network. So the idea behind this is, well, if we control the infrastructure, we know what we need to scale it for. We have to take that responsibility on and provide the right redundancy, because some of those transit providers, they're not always sometimes, there's some level of oversubscription with some of them. So you have to take on that responsibility, and we have to build that on our network. So that responsibility becomes ours. Another part about this is reliable performance. What I mean by that is when we go and build this backbone network, I get to pick and choose what types of paths we're going to put traffic on. And I can optimize for low latency when I'm connecting between any two different points, but also how the whole thing stitches together and trying to optimize for any traffic from any region to any region or edge pop. Finally, uh, connecting closer to customers. And this is a really interesting one where if you look at if something was just an island and it had its own network connectivity to the internet, um, you're limited in your options when it comes to things like traffic engineering. Um, I only have so many different providers I can select from. If there's some kind of fiber issue in the area and multiple upstream providers are impacted, I don't have a lot of options there. Now, through the backbone, all of a sudden my options open up. I can send that traffic to a different city, ingress and egress. I have a lot more to play with, and I have a lot more options. When things that are outside of my control off net happen, I can actually go and exercise that. Um, it gives us a lot of uh, great availability characteristics and allows us to avoid things like whether it's congestion or problems on an internet exchange, anything like that. Um, pairing disputes, we can basically have a lot more uh, options that we can go and exercise. The main thing behind this presentation, though, and I don't know how much we've really said this in the past before, but we definitely want to stress is that all commercial region-to-region -region traffic um, stays on our infrastructure, um, except for China. But um, that's something I want to definitely want you to walk away with. So when it comes to building a global backbone network, uh, there's a few things to consider. And probably one of the biggest things is going to be uh, extreme auditing of fiber paths. And what I mean by that is when you actually go and want to connect two different locations together, that involves actually looking at what the end-to-end -end latency is going to be and what do you expect the fiber cable, what path it's going to take, and what's the end uh, result that you're going to get. And when you bring that into the network, how are other regions or other locations that are going to rely upon that link used? And you can actually go and model the network to say, I'm going to bring a new link up between these two locations, assign the kind of routing costs that we put on there, and that we can get an idea of how does that impact all regions in a full mesh of connectivity. Another part that's really important is path hazards. Specifically looking at when you're building a backbone, where does that fiber actually go through? Um, does it go through a transit tunnel? Does it go through a bridge? Does it cut across like a waterway? Um, understanding a lot of the risks and actually assessing a score to understand this fiber, what's the likelihood that it's going to get cut? Um, that's really, really critical. 
And uh, in some parts of the world, uh, the fiber cuts are more often. Maybe it's due to lots of construction, not a lot of permitting and controls in there. And when you deal with those situations, you have to find a way to solve it. Um, and you usually have to do that by dropping down additional capacity on even more redundant paths to deal with what essentially could be a lot of fiber cuts happening. And that's something that we do in certain parts of the world. The other part is the repair expectations. If it's terrestrial fiber, for example, um, if it was to be cut, it could take a few hours, maybe a few days to fix it. Could be a lot of other things that come in, into the mix there. Um, depending on what happens, if power lines were cut down too, generally it's the power that's gonna get fixed before the fiber. But for terrestrial, it's a little bit simpler. When it comes to something like a subsea cable, you're talking about weeks, multiple weeks, to get a ship out there to go, to pull it out from the bottom of the ocean and repair it. And as a result of that, you have to factor that into when you're building out capacity across the network and understanding, you know, you have to, some, this capacity may be out for a while, do we have enough capacity on alternate paths to deal with that? Path diversity is another thing that's really important. I mentioned kind of in the metro area, it's certainly a concern, and the backbone side of it is as well. What I mean by that is that that fiber path, you may have multiple fiber paths going between two different locations, but do they ever cross over or intersect? In some cases, you may have a case where a cable will intersect with another one at a street intersection. Can you really consider that cable truly diverse? The answer is no, you can't. And we use this thing called shared risk link groups, a term within kind of the networking industry, your SRLGs, to identify those points of commonality. And basically, we have to include that in our failure modeling to say, yes, these paths do actually converge at some point. I have to assume that they will both get cut. And in order to do that, we have to go and build additional capacity on other diverse paths to go and basically build around it. So, Another part on the fiber side is understanding the capacity and scale of when we're putting that infrastructure in, understanding how many 100 gigs units am I going to get out of it. For example, um, what's the maximum that I expect to have? And at some point, when do I need to grow and basically build another cable on another performance equivalent path? So you have to understand the underlying technology and the optical capabilities to understand exactly how much traffic I could squeeze out of that infrastructure. Another part, definitely talked about the latency part, but one thing that people need to understand is there's latency on a particular cable, but when it gets cut, there's gonna be a penalty for that traffic has to reroute around another path. Um, that's the reality of it. In order to get some sort of additional diversity path, there'll be some sort of latency penalty. So that's one of the things that we think about is that for every link in the network, we think that it will go down. What is the latency that we will see otherwise when, when that happens? Um, and we have to account for that and kind of basically come up with judge, a way to think about is that too much? Should we actually go and invest to build another path around there so that the latency bump that might happen during one of these faults isn't significant? I mentioned a lot about 100 gig interfaces. On the backbone, it's all optimized for 100 gig. We really like 100 gig here. Um, one simple reason, it gives you a lot more burst. As we drop down a lot of 100 gig interfaces, if there's a sudden traffic burst, I have room to play with before any kind of traffic management system will kick in. Um, you compare that to 10 gig, just simply not enough room. So we really like 100 gig, and that's basically the new normal for a lot of uh, the backbone infrastructure. Finally, one of the things is when you're building a backbone network, what should it look like? And we took a lot of uh, design patterns that we saw in the data center space, and we replicated it into the backbone. And you'll see that in a second here when, in a picture. Um, not only that, but we took a lot of the same toolings, um, for example, network monitoring and auto remediation system. And, and we use that in the, in the backbone space as well. Um, it's been pr working pretty well for us. So here's an example of what AWS Global Backbone Fabric looks like. Similar to the structure to the data center space, in which case we have all these cells at the edge. Um, there's kind of two different main cells that we use. Um, the transit center and edge pops, they are a component of it. Basically, that's where traffic on ramps and off ramps into a backbone uh, networking fabric. Uh, we have a fabric between all these cells together to stitch them all together. Um, and then we have the backbone cells, which is this is where we actually land the long haul 100 gig circuits and make up the backbone. One of the things that we do here is we like, once again, this notion of going wide. When we go and add that capacity, we spread that, stripe it essentially across a number of devices. We don't just take a bunch of 100 gig circuits and we land it on a lag on a router and we're good. We don't like that because we know that that router is going to fail at some point. And we don't want to lose a lot of capacity that goes with it. So we go and we stripe that connectivity across many devices. So when you lose that one, you're only using a small percentage of traffic. Um, and that's how a lot of the, the backbone uh, network infrastructure is built on that. So mainly services getting traffic to and from the backbone, but also handles transiting traffic that may pass through a particular location. 
Uh, one thing I want to definitely cover here before we get into the edge pops is some backbone path additions that we've made. We've made uh, a number of investments on actually some sub subsea cables over the last few years. Uh, two years ago, uh, I believe James Hamilton talked about the Haviki cable that goes from Australia uh, to the west coast of the United States. Um, happy to announce that um, earlier this year, uh, that is actually up and online and we have traffic on it, run, running on it right now. Um, we also have another cable uh, which goes from Japan into the west coast of the United States, which is the Jupiter cable that we're working on, which should be coming up in the next few years. And finally, um, there's a really interesting cable, which is called the Beta Bay Express cable. And that goes from Singapore, stops kind of in Hong Kong, and then moves on to the west coast of the United States. What's really interesting about this cable, if you can see it in the drawing there, there's this little part in the middle of the ocean there, uh, which is a branching unit. And traditionally, with a lot of these subsea cables, when they go from one point to another, they'll have branching units along them. And that basically allows them to extend some connectivity that could go to a particular country, and so it can hop on and hop off. But traditionally, in subsea networks, that was a set of fibers, undersea fibers, and there's not many fibers in some of the undersea stuff. Um, you're only dealing with you know, maybe a dozen or so. Um, some of those fiber strands would come off and stop in that country and then hop back on. But it was fixed. It was in the cable. No one's touching it again. Whatever you got is what you got. Um, well, what's really neat about this cable is what they call a wavelength selector switch, WSS. And what that actually allows is you can remotely re basically reconfigure the cable using a wavelength division multiplexing technology so you can actually control how much capacity, for example, needs to go to Hong Kong, which makes it really dynamic where you can actually scale up the cable in different ways based upon actually how traffic may be growing versus in the previous world with subsea cables, it was fixed and there's only so many options that you had there. And so this just really wanted to highlight that this is something that we're constantly looking at, um, not just in the Pacific, but north in, in the Atlantic and other places, as well as terrestrial, of looking at different fiber investments, mainly to lower latency, provide additional diversity, um, and support some of the capacity demands that we have. That, that said, I uh, want to go and transition over here to Steve Seymour uh, to talk about some of our EdgePop infrastructure. Oops, I'm taking this thing. Cool. So, yeah, we spent a bit of time looking at the, the data centers, looking at the backbone, but there are these other really important pieces of our infrastructure, which are the edge pops. So we have two particular ways that we connect out to the public internet. You've heard about one of them, the transit centers themselves, and the edge pops are the other type. And these have something in common. The idea of these, both of these types of location is we want them to be somewhere where we have lots of options for connectivity with the outside world, where we can connect with other providers, with other networks. So these are typically based in places that you've probably heard of as interconnection facilities, carrier hotels, um, carrier neutral facilities, colos. They're the, the kind of terms that we associate with this. And these are buildings that are deliberately intended to be hosting large amounts of network infrastructure, so both our own and other providers. Now, within those facilities, there's quite often the, the coexistence of something called internet exchanges. And internet exchanges are basically large fabrics um, effectively switches, that all of these different providers can connect into. And those fabrics give you the option to connect with all of those different providers, perhaps with just a, a low number of connections. Now, those internet exchanges can actually span multiple buildings. So you know, a particular colo provider might have multiple buildings in a city, and the particular internet exchange might span across those. So what are the, the purpose of these edge pops that we had? Well, first of all, the transit centers are associated with the region, and physically they're located quite close to the region. But we want to extend the edge of our network out further out into the internet. So it allows us to extend that global infrastructure right out to what we call the, the internet edge. We've got this backbone network that Tom's just been talking about. If we can place these edge pops out on that backbone, much closer to where our customers want to consume our services from, we can get them onto our network in a much easier way. It also gives us a way of scaling that connectivity. You know, we can pick up lots of connectivity in multiple locations. We can increase it very easily by adding in connections at these locations. And of course, as I said, these are buildings and facilities where there are lots of other network providers. So what we can do here is we can say that this is the best possible location to connect with that particular network. And we can do that in all of these edge pops around the world. So within the edge pops themselves, we've actually got quite a lot of different services. And these should be services that I'm guessing you're pretty familiar with. So we've got things like AWS Direct Connect. As Tom mentioned, that's the service that we have that allows you to connect from your infrastructure into AWS. So it makes sense that we'd want to put the equipment for that out at the edge of our network. 
So this is a, a place where you can then get your fiber, bring your connectivity in, perhaps via a partner, into that location, connect into our infrastructure. We've got CloudFront, our content delivery network. We've got Route 53, our DNS service. And we've also got Shield, our DDoS protection service. You can kind of see why these all make sense to be out there in these edge pop locations. But these edge pops actually perform a couple of other functions as well as hosting those particular services. Obviously, they give you access to the global backbone. It gives you that on-ramp into our infrastructure, and then you can be carried across to our regions. But it's also where we do pick up the actual external internet connectivity itself. So where we can pick up peering sessions with other providers, with transit providers, with our, our peers, and obviously with these services that I've been talking about. So this diagram is probably starting to look a bit familiar now. Um, these are, this is an example of the cellular architecture that we have within an edge pop. Um, and you can see that those cells are pretty similar in terms of how we think about things. So the difference, though, is that we make it very easy to attach the services I mentioned. So for example, we can take CloudFront, we can take Direct Connect, and we have a very easy way to connect them into this fabric that we've built out at the edge pops. So this is definitely a pattern that we see repeating in multiple places within our infrastructure. It obviously needs to have the cells that enable us to connect onto the backbone. You saw some examples of that earlier. It has the cells that enable us to connect out to the rest of the internet. And obviously, we can keep scaling that as well as we need to. So very easy to add in the services. You can see them at the edge of this particular diagram. So let's talk a, a little bit about CloudFront, first of all. This is actually a really critical service that's out in our, in our edge pops here. And um, it's very important because the point of CloudFront is we want to be able to cache content and get it closer to where our customers are viewing that content from. Well, bearing in mind that these edge pops are all over the world, these are locations that are, are very well connected to perhaps people like your broadband provider at home. So the people that are looking at the content that's going to be cached in CloudFront, they're very close to where these edge pops are. If we take Route 53, this, has, this is slightly different. Um, what actually happens here is we use something called Anycast. So we can take a set of IP addresses that we use for Route 53 to represent the DNS servers that we have there. And we can actually advertise those IP addresses from multiple edge pops around the world. So this is using both IPv4 and IPv6. And Anycast is a, a very nice way of dragging traffic from customers to the nearest edge pop. So slightly different to the way that CloudFront works and the way content delivery networks work. Mentioned Direct Connect a couple of times. These are definitely um, intended to be in places that are very easily accessible to our customers. We want Direct Connect to be in a colo facility where you might have your infrastructure and where connecting into us becomes as simple as ordering a cross connect from that particular provider. That means that you actually get the most optimal connectivity you can into our infrastructure. And you're then obviously on our backbone and that gives you access to all of our regions. So you can use things like Direct Connect Gateway at that point to access VPCs in any of our commercial regions around the world. Now, when we deploy Direct Connect into one of our edge locations, we obviously need to make sure that it's highly redundant for you to connect to. So whenever we deploy a Direct Connect location, there'll always be multiple routers available for customers to connect to. And obviously, our recommendation here, though, for customers is that they actually meet us in multiple edge locations. So that's why we deploy Direct Connect into these multiple locations around the world, as close as we can get them to you as a customer. Now, something that's really quite cool that we have out on the edge is Shield. So this is our, our DDoS protection service. And the great thing about this is, this is where traffic enters our network, remember, out at these edge pops. Well, by having Shield out at the edge pops itself, it means that we can actually scrub that traffic right at the edge before we carry it across the network. It means that we're avoiding having to carry that traffic all the way to the region before perhaps it gets dropped. So we can stop it out at the internet edge and preserve the rest of our backbone for use for real traffic, traffic that we do want to make it to the regions. So that's really quite a, a cool thing that we have deployed out at the edge. And then that final piece that's crucial out at the edge pops is the internet connectivity itself. Now, you might be aware, but there are two different types of internet connectivity um, that you would typically pick up at a location like this. Um, generally referred to as transit and peering. So when you have a connection to a transit provider, it means you get access to all of the networks that are connected to that transit provider, so to the whole of the internet, um, all of their peers, everyone that they are connected to. Peering, however, gives you that ability to connect to one particular network. So now you are connected to that individual network, nothing that they're connected to, and you have the most direct path possible into that peered network. Now, we think that is absolutely the way forward. That's what we do a lot of. So we have thousands of peering relationships at these edge locations all around the world, trying to give you the most optimal path from our infrastructure into and out of those particular networks. 
we can establish that peering in a couple of different ways, um, and that's something that we're going to dive into in a second. So I've said peering a couple of times. What does that actually mean? Well, this concept of private peering um, and public peering, they're two slightly different ways of looking at things. So what is private peering, or a PNI, a private network interconnection? Well, this is actually where we talk to a particular peer and we establish a physical connection between our infrastructure and their infrastructure. So we arrange a cross-connect of fiber between one of our routers and one of their routers. We then add more connections in from more of our routers to theirs to increase that capacity. And it means we can define how much is needed and work with that particular peer to build as much redundancy into that connectivity as possible. Public peering, however, goes back to using um, constructs like those internet exchanges that I mentioned earlier. So these are fabrics where many different providers connect into that particular fabric, just like we do. And over that smaller set of connections, you get access to all of the peers that are on that particular exchange. So the thing about that, though, is that we have all of that traffic coming over you know, a relatively small number of links. It's not one link per peer that we're connecting to here. It is, however, a really good way of picking up a lot of connectivity, and we quite often do it when we move into a new location. So you'll see us connect to lots of peers over uh, a public peering exchange, and then as we start to see traffic flow with a particular peer, we'll have a conversation with them and talk about moving perhaps to a PNI and increasing that connectivity because we now know what it looks like. We now, now know how much is actually needed. So just as a, an example, you can kind of see the difference between those two types of, of setup and how direct they actually are. So at the top there, we've got the PNI, and it is as simple as our network on one side of the connection and the peer's network on the other. We arrange that cross-connect, we configure BGP, we bring up a session, and we are now announcing each other's networks to each other. It's as direct as you're going to get. However, in the lower example here, where we're going over an exchange, you can see that we've got our router on one side, we connect into the switch, the fabric that I'm talking about here, and on the other side of it, you've got all of these different peers. Now, at that point, obviously, we have an amount of bandwidth into that exchange. We monitor it very closely. But it is possible that we could end up with lots of traffic coming over there. So that's something that we monitor very, very closely. And then we shift um, people over to private peering when possible. How does all of this work? So we, Tom talked about the, the control planes that we have internally. Well, BGP is the control plane of the internet. Um, it's a very stable standard environment for establishing session information between two peers. So in those previous examples between two routers, it's what's used to exchange that information of what is reachable behind those two networks. So they exchange messages regularly, the two devices on each side of a peering session, and it advertises these particular networks are reachable via me. And we identify those networks using something called AS numbers, autonomous system numbers. And basically, BGP here is providing that reachability information. So what does that actually look like? This is uh, another example here where we've got an Amazon router on the left-hand side connecting with an external network provider. You can see that we've actually got a couple of different AS numbers out here. So we've got the AWS global network on AS16509 on the left, and it is peered with this external provider. So we have a BGP session between those two routers. Behind that router, though, there are actually two networks. And what BGP enables us to do here is see that there are multiple paths out to these different networks. There's another network behind the one we're directly connected to, and we receive all of that information using BGP. We can then take that and actually decide whether we want to use this path, or perhaps do we have another more direct path to that second network via another location or another set of equipment. So the internet uses this mechanism to exchange routing information between all of the different peers out there, all the different providers. Um, the internet routing table at the moment is over 7,000 prefixes on v4. Um, it's just over 60,000 on IPv6 at the moment. Um, but it is just a, a control plane protocol. It's exchanging that information. It's not actually carrying any of the traffic itself. It's not carrying any details about the performance of the networks that are providing this connectivity or even the capacity. So it's just saying that a particular network is reachable via this path. But actually, we still need that information. So you know, we, we have to look at some other ways to achieve that. So you've seen that within the edge pop, we have a very similar design to the data center infrastructure. And one of the things that you might have noticed is that we still need to make sure we go wide in terms of our connectivity. So when we establish these connections to the external peers, we actually want to make sure that we do that across multiple routers on our side. You know, we, we absolutely acknowledge that hardware will fail at some point on you know, either side of that connectivity. So let's plan for that in advance, and therefore make sure we have the connections striped across multiple routers on our side. 
But the problem is we know lots about our network, we know lots about our infrastructure, but we don't necessarily know lots about the peers that we're connecting with. So for example, we may have four routers on our side of a connection, but what's on the other side of that? So we can do a couple of things to help us here. And here's the example. You've got a whole bunch of Amazon routers on the, on the left-hand side, and we've got three networks that we're connecting to on the right. Now at the top, we've got a peer here who happens to have two routers. So that's fine. We can establish peering sessions across multiple of our routers spread across the two that they have. But in the middle, we've got a peer who only has one router. So we've established multiple peering sessions, so that's good from our side. But on their side, it's only a single router. And we may not know that. They may not have told us that. But we can actually extract something from BGP to give us a bit of a hint as to the situation on their side. So there's something called the BGP peer ID. Um, it's an identifier for that particular router. And we can actually use our infrastructure to look at where we're seeing that peer ID coming from. So we're actually seeing it in this case coming across multiple routers on our side. So we have a pretty good idea that the peer we're connecting with might only have one device on their side connecting to multiple of, on our side. That means we can then have a conversation about that, see if that's something that we can change or improve, or do we just need to build that into our planning and our, our modeling for connectivity failover. So we have this connectivity, we have the information about which networks are reachable via these various peering sessions, but actually we don't know much about the performance at this point. So what we need to be doing is actually monitoring the data plane itself, so where the traffic is actually flowing. And there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. So one way is that we can actually use the log data that we have from our various services to collect that internet performance data and feed it back into our infrastructure. So we obviously have the services that, that people are using out there. Well, that background telemetry that we have from that is really useful in terms of giving us an idea of how that connectivity is performing. So we can take that. We can also use some of our other tools we have to, to monitor traffic flowing over the internet. But actually, we now need to consider what happens when something goes wrong, because things will fail. And this is where it's really important to have something that is automatic. You know, we've got thousands and thousands of these routers across our network. We're certainly not logging into individual routers and, and shutting down individual um, connections when we see problems. We need to do this in an automatic way. And this is something that is generally referred to as traffic engineering. Um, it's a way that we can look at that data that we have and then shift our traffic around depending on what we're seeing from those metrics. So we ideally want to be able to route around problems that are happening. And that needs to happen in two different directions. And this is something that you, you may not be aware of, but out on the internet, things are very rarely symmetric. Traffic doesn't always flow over the same path in one direction and then come back the same way. So we have to look at that both from an inbound perspective and from an outbound perspective. So in terms of outbound traffic, the way we can look at that is actually really quite simple. We've got our connectivity out here. We can identify that packets are perhaps not making it to a particular destination when they go over one of these paths. So this is where we can then say, OK, something is impairing that connection. Perhaps there's a, an interface that's congested, or perhaps there is even a connection down, further downstream, that we can't even see. Well, at that point, using that information we have from BGP, we can see that there was an alternative path. And perhaps we weren't using it before. Well, absolutely now we can. We can shift our traffic out of the AWS network to use that other path to get to that particular peer. What about from the opposite direction, if it's a, an inbound um, challenge that we're seeing. Perhaps we're, we're not seeing the traffic coming into the network that we're expecting. How can we influence that? Well, again, this is where BGP comes in. We can actually push, um, using BGP, messages out to our peers that says, we would prefer traffic to come in this particular direction. So you can see here the source on the right-hand side of the screen. Perhaps that particular flow is interrupted. So we can use BGP to signal the fact that we would prefer that traffic to come in on a different path. So you can see that these are two tools that we have to manage that connectivity. All right. Uh, well, let's kind of wrapping up on the presentation here. Um, I want to have you walk away with a few conclusions um, of some of the things that we covered here. Um, one of them is we have a strong isolation from failures in the network, and we do this all across the network, whether it be in the data center, the availability zones, the regions. We've broken the network down into these individual components, and we've built fault isolation into them. And we do that all across the layers from end to end. Um, Another part that's really important is the extensive monitoring we talked about that we use inside the data center networks, we use inside the backbone, as well as on the internet-facing side, um, and how all of that network telemetry feeds into auto-remediation systems that go and take action uh, without operator involvement. Um, 
We talked about large amounts of capacity and over-provisioning. It's something that we really firmly believe in when we're building our infrastructure that we have to anticipate that links are going to go out of service and routers are going to fail. And we want to be able to weather through that without any kind of compromising of availability and the customer's ability to send traffic through the network. Um, you have to do that at the same time as scaling, all the way from host ports to um, different layers within the network, and that we have to be able to bolt on additional capacity with ease. Finally, the other part is our custom hardware, those things that we do, like I give you an example of the single chip routers, um, platforms that we've innovated on and we've brought additional functionality where um, you know, we don't need all the features that a vendor could drop to us on a routing platform. We only need the features that we really care about and we can actually fine tune the device based upon our requirements. I don't have to worry about getting a feature from a vendor that's in a feature that I don't even care about breaking the thing that I need. And being able to have that end-to-end -end control lets you really build the infrastructure for the things that specifically we need to service our customers. So that's about it. Wanted to thank you for uh, joining. Um, we're going to have a meet and greet um, after this, um, which is in the area east, level one Willow Lounge. Um, it's going to start about 15 minutes after the session. It'll run for half an hour. Um, I'll bring some samples of some fiber cables if you want to look at them. They're in my backpack. Uh, the police dog looked at it. Um, had to go through the security <laughs> there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, definitely, um, yeah, we'll have Q&A there. Uh, we're not going to do it here. We're going to go straight over there now. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thanks.